Okay, I quickly mentioned uh, about DOM. Um, there's some other kind of fun acronyms here. POM, which is particulate organic matter. DOC, which is dissolved organic carbon. And POC, which is particulate organic carbon. These are just oceanographic shorthand, so you don't have to write out these words. There's also DON and PON. So if you've got DOM, POM, DOC, POC, DON and PON, if it helps you to say those often, please, please feel free to do so. We're basically describing forms of organic matter. If you think about in your own yard, like leaf litter or grass clippings, those are really organic matter. And if you think about the kind of tea-like substance that you find in lakes and rivers, organic matter, whether it's dissolved, in the case of the tea-like substances, or whether it's particles, in the case of the bits and pieces of leaves and grass. All these things are important in the ocean. They play an important role in what we call the microbial food web. Um, they provide an important source of carbon and sometimes nitrogen for ocean food webs. And I'm just going to kind of leave it at that um, because as we start talking about productivity in the ocean and start talking about ocean food webs, we'll start talking more about DOM and POM and DOC and POC and DON and PON. Okay? Here's an example from a beach I hiked to on Vancouver Island in Canada. It took me a couple hours to get there, and there was this river flowing out into the ocean. This is the Pacific Ocean here, again, Vancouver Island in Canada. And you can see this sort of tea-like color. This is a figure in your book as well, figure 614. These are dis This is dissolved organic matter or dissolved substances in the ocean. And you can see it flowing out into the ocean. And it turns out they're an important component of the chemistry of the ocean for a lot of different reasons other than the ones that I've just described as well. All right, dissolved gases. Well, the two main ones are oxygen. And of course, we know that things like fishes require oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we know carbon dioxide is being important because it plays a major role in our climate. And there's only a couple things I also want to sort of emphasize with regard to dissolved gases. And let's start with oxygen. When oxygen is required by organisms and they're not getting enough, like you and me, for example, if we weren't getting enough oxygen, we would be in a condition called hypoxic. Low oxygen waters are hypoxic. Hypoxic waters can be dangerous to organisms because they put them under stress. Some just die because they can't survive at those low concentrations of oxygen. As it turns out, some natural processes, as well as human processes, generate hypoxia or contribute to hypoxia in the ocean. And hypoxia can be a bad thing because if fish die, then you get all that organic matter building up. You get potential for even greater hypoxia and it smells really bad. So if you've ever been down to a little bay or a marina somewhere and it stinks, chances are that little bay or marina was suffering from hypoxia. If the, if the dissolved oxygen is completely absent, then we have what are called anoxic waters. And there's a term used for anoxic waters called dead zones. And unfortunately, that word dead implies that nothing lives there at all. But as you know, and as I know, and as we know, some organisms can live without oxygen. There's some organisms living without oxygen inside your body right now, and they produce something called hydrogen sulfide. And that's all I'm going to say about that, but that anaerobic or anoxic process is what produces that not-so-pleasant-smelling gas that occasionally leaks out when you're among friends. Got me? Okay, so hypoxia and anoxic and anoxia are two conditions that we're going to talk a little bit more about and we'll study them in greater detail in chapter 15. I will point out though that hypoxic and anoxic waters can occur naturally and it happens largely at midwater depths where organic matter produced through photosynthesis at the surface sinks down and that organic matter is acted upon by bacteria just like leaf litter and grass clippings are acted upon and broken down by bacteria. And in breaking that organic matter down, oxygen is consumed. And if that water happens to be what we call stratified, so it's not mixing, let's put it that way, then 
oxygen can't be replenished to these midwater depths. And so oxygen concentrations go low or completely zero or what we call anoxic conditions. Now, as it turns out, some organisms can live under hypoxic and moderately hypoxic conditions. Few large organisms, very few, none that I know of, can live in completely anoxic waters. And so this is probably this jellyfish like looking thing probably shouldn't be here. But some of these other organisms can tolerate low oxygen waters. And in some cases, seamounts, which we talked about in chapter four, penetrate at these midwater depths and provide a platform for organisms. And in doing so, because these water depths are low in oxygen and being low in oxygen exclude organisms that can't tolerate it, well, it gives a place for these guys to live. These guys can, these certain kinds of sea stars or snails or other types of organisms can tolerate these waters. And because of their tolerance for low oxygen, they find a convenient place to live where they don't have to compete with anybody else for food or space. So anoxic conditions, even though we normally associate hypoxia and anoxia with a problem, it turns out that in some cases, in naturally occurring cases, they actually provide an environment for organisms. And so uh, we shouldn't always associate hypoxia and anoxia with something that's not desired. In fact, throughout most of the Eastern Pacific, we find this to be a very common feature where we have low oxygen zones throughout the Pacific and also in other places in the world ocean.